it's been a rough year and a half for our law enforcement. Uh, and so we want to let all of our uniformed services, all of those people who go out each and every day and sacrifice so that we can live the life that we live, uh, we want to recognize them. So I, at this time, I'd like to ask first that all of our armed service veterans, anyone who served in any branch of armed service, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, would you please stand so that we can recognize you? Okay, and it looks like many of our law enforcement that work here, that attend here, are probably working today. But if there is anyone in law enforcement or a first responder, we ask that you please stand as well. Okay, they're all working. Well, we just want to let you all know to thank you for your service and let you know that we do appreciate the sacrifice that you made and we thank you for it. happen to see Brother Finance or Brother Jose or, or I can't think of the gentleman from Kinsley who is also a first responder. Uh, just shake your head and tell them thank you. And maybe every once in a while if you see any of our EMS over in the uh, quick shop, buy them a Now, I, I want to point out that we are, as much as we may not want to admit it, we are to a certain extent, products of our environment. Uh, an example would be, uh, I was raised in Detroit, Michigan. And if you are raised in Detroit, Michigan, one thing that you do is you lock your house door. <laughs> and you lock your car. You, it, it, that's just the thing, if you want your car to be there, you, you lock it and then hope that the guy that's looking to steal cars goes to a car that's easier to steal. And that's just a part of the environment, that's just a part of the way that you do things if you're raised in that environment. Then I moved here, and I, I, I still to this day remember, I wasn't here when the moving truck got here, and some of the, some of the deacons went over to the parsonage to help uh, move. And I can remember uh, Deacon Lauren telling me that his, his truck, was in the way of the uh, movie truck. And the, the guy who was from Chicago, and people from Chicago have very much the same mentality as people from Detroit. You lock stuff. And I, I remember him saying that the guy said, well, you know, whoever, that, whoever's truck that is, we, we need you to move it. And Lawrence said, well, just go out there and move it. He said, well, can I have the keys? He said, the keys are in it's on. And, and then I, I remember talking with, uh, Pastor Jeff, the Mennonite pastor, and saying, well, I wanted to stop by your house and, and, and have a conversation with you. He said, well, just come to the garage and come on in. It's open. <laughs> okay. Not strange to someone raised in Greensburg, though, because that is what you're used to. Uh, and I remember, <laughs> I, I remember once, and this is really funny, I remember Brother Ted telling me that he leaves his car un unlocked so that they don't break the window to get in. That way, when he gets it back, he doesn't have to worry about replacing the window. And so, we are all products, to some extent, of our environment. And I say to some extent because there is God that, that gets it, and God can change us in, in transformative ways. But the reason I bring that up is because I was thinking about my grandparents the other day. And both of my grandparents were children of the Depression. They were teenagers and grew into adulthood during the Depression. Now my grandmother, she was a city girl. She could not stand the country. If my grandmother were alive today and she came to visit, after day four, she's got to go home. She would have to go home because she was a true city girl who married a country woman. Because my, my dad, um, my, my granddad, if he came here, he would have think that this was some sort of great metropolis based on where he was born. So they were, they were different people, but they were both raised during the Depression. And one thing that I've noticed is that with many people raised during the Depression era, they have three things in common. The first thing is they don't throw anything away. Some people, people raised during the Depression, they don't throw things away. Now, it might be that the object cannot be used 
for what it was originally intended for, but perhaps it could be used for something else. And I used to always wonder about that. Why do you say so many things? When my grandmother passed away, they went down into the basement, and some of the stuff she was saying, I was like, hey, you know, what, what, what's going on here? But if you went through the Depression when money was scarce and you had to make do with what you had, you didn't throw anything away. The second thing that many people raised during the Depression era have is that they are used to living in homes that have multiple generations within the home. A, a TV show that at least people my age and older might be familiar with is The Waltons. And how, I don't know how many generations you had in that house, but you, you have a lot of them. I mean, if you ever saw that show, you know that it took at least three minutes for them to say good night to everybody. <laughs> because that's how the show ended every time, I and mean, it was just good night to everybody in the house. But a person raised in depression, they, that is not unusual to them, because they were used to having those multiple generations under one roof, because you didn't have a choice. The last thing that a person of the, of the Depression generation is used to is they were used to sharing what they had. They didn't have a choice. In order to do that, in order to survive, you had to be able to do that. So you had a little bit of extra soup, you shared it. The harvest was a little bit better that year, you had a little bit extra, you shared it. A little bit of extra bread that you baked, you shared it with the people in your neighborhood. And that's simply, you did that to survive. And so what I want to talk about today is that I want to talk about sharing, uh, specifically the sharing your bread. And when, when we know that we have been talking about the physical world versus the spiritual world, and so when I'm talking about sharing your bread, I'm talking about sharing your spiritual bread. Of course, we have been in the book of John, and so our text for this morning is going to come from the Gospel according to John chapter 6. Verses 25 through 35, I would ask that all of you would please stand in reference to the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Share your bread. The Gospel according to John, chapter 6, verses 25 through 25, I will be reading from the New International Version. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and it is written, He gave them bread from the heavens to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is the Father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whosoever comes to me will never hunger, and whosoever believes in me will never be thirsty. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy and true word. You may be seated. Jesus was here. 
Where is he? And they realized maybe he went to the other side. And so the text tells us earlier that they got into boats and they traveled to the other side and they found Jesus. And they're like, well, Jesus, what did you get here? Of course, he doesn't tell them, well, you know, I decided to take a stroll across the lake late at night and, and come to the other side. And the reason he does it is because that miracle wasn't for them. That miracle was for the disciples specifically. But then he tells them, I know why you're looking for me. I know what it is that you want from me. And the fact is that those individuals, and sometimes we as well, we ask for the wrong things from God. They were, they were looking for the wrong things. He tells them, I know that it's not because of the signs you see. I know it's not because of what you witnessed. I know that it's because you ate the loaves and you ate the fishes and you were fooled. And so in looking for him, what they are looking for is they are looking for the fulfillment of a physical need. We need food and, and Jesus is supplying the food and so we're going to go and look for Jesus and maybe he'll do it again. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm saying the wrong thing here. I don't want you to think that I'm saying that physical needs are unimportant. Because they are. We, we have to feed ourselves in order to survive. But what Jesus is saying to them is that you're looking for the wrong thing. Yes, I can provide for the physical needs, but there is something that I can provide for you that is even more important than these loaves that you're eating. From. There is something more important that I can provide for you that is even more important than the fishes. That there's something more important that I can provide. So you are seeing it. You are so consumed by the physical and the fact that you ate the loaves and the fishes. And beyond that, they are asking for Jesus to prove that he is equal to Moses. Now, of course, 2,000 years later, we notice how silly that question is. But they're saying, you know what? That miracle of you turning the five and clothes and two fish, that was a great miracle. And we ate and you, you fed us for a day. But Moses, Moses gave us bread from heaven and he fed the entire nation for 40 years. So this was a minor miracle compared to what our father, compared to what the prophet Moses did. And so you're saying to us that we should follow you. What sign, what wonder, what miracle can you give us to prove to us who you are? And Jesus just says, first of all, let me correct something here. It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. It was God who gave you the bread from heaven. But mainly at this point, what those individuals are looking for, they're looking for physical nourishment. And they're looking for Jesus to prove to them through the miracle of these, this physical, physical nourishment that he's at least equal to Moses. And sometimes we have to take into account that we do the same things. Maybe it's not food. Maybe it's a possession. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a house. Sometimes, as much as I hate to admit it, those that are amongst our family, Christians, we, we, we look at God and He is to us basically the celestial ATM machine. And, and we look and we say, okay, but what have you done for me lately? And we may not use those exact words, that may not even be what our thought process is, but in essence, that is what we are doing. But what Jesus is saying, what he was saying to those individuals, what is being said to us is, I have something more important to offer you. What I have to offer is greater than what you are asking for. You are asking for the wrong things. And in that he says, don't ask for this food that will spoil you. You see, it doesn't matter how good the food is, how much you have. We just went through harvest. And it doesn't matter that you have a bumper harvest and that, that you have all of this extra grain. If it, if it doesn't go anywhere, eventually it will spoil. We got Milo right out behind the church here. If that doesn't get moved at some point, it's going to go bad. You can have refrigerators full and cabinets and cupboards and, 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 and pantries full of food. If you don't eventually consume it, it will go bad and spoil. And Jesus is 
saying, I have something to offer to you that is eternal. I'm going to offer you the bread of life. So if I will offer you the bread of life, this bread of life will never spoil. And then they say, well, what is the bread of life? He says, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the way. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so, and that is what he's trying to get us to understand, what he was trying to get them to understand, is that I'm offering you something more important than just daily subsistence, daily living. I am offering you eternal life. This life that we are in, brothers and sisters, right now, will eventually end. And what he was trying to get them to understand is to think beyond the day to day. Think about eternity. And I am offering you eternity. And eternity can only come through the taking of the bread of life. And he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm offering it to you. I'm offering it to you. And they still don't get it because what do they say? Well, what work? Key word there. What work must we do to do the work of God? And he gives them a very simple answer. Believe in the one who God sent. But again, we have to understand that the only way to salvation is through accepting of this bread of life, that there is nothing that you can do, there's nothing I can do to work our way into heaven. You can become a millionaire, give all everything away to the poor, and, and, and decide that you're going to live what the world says is a good life, and you cannot work your way into heaven. You can't have a checklist and say, okay, did this, did this, did this, I'm getting in. That is not the way it works. Jesus is saying there's only one way, the bread of life, and I am offering it to you. Can't work our way into heaven. It's not, it's not about work. Now, that being said, don't get, don't, as, as, as some of my God children say, don't get it twisted now. I'm not saying you don't have to do anything. I'm saying that you can't do anything to get into heaven. You have to accept the bread of life. But after you do that, once you accept the bread of life, once you accept Jesus Christ, what happens is we get the Holy Spirit, it transforms us and it changes us. And what does the Bible say? It says take care of the hungry, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give medicine to the sick, take care of the least amongst us. And we do those things not out of obligation so that we can get into heaven because we know we've already been saved through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. We do those things because our heart has changed and we want to do them. It is not an obligation. It is something that we do because we know it needs to be done. We do it out of love. And I can tell you, you it's different when you do something out of our obligation and when you do it out of love. And so, yes, there is work to be done, and yes, we will work, but that work is not what is saving us. That work is not what has opened up the windows of heaven for us. It is the fact that Jesus is offering that bread of life, and we accept it, and that when upon accepting it, we realize, hey, you know what? There is nothing I can do. Thank God that he was there. Thank God that although I am not worthy, although I am not, I'm not able to do anything at all except for accept what Jesus has given me, thank God that that's possible. The leadership and I were having conversations, and even, even with Roger, and they were telling me, talking about how sometimes just as, as a leader within the church, whether it be a deacon, whether it be someone who's answering the call of ministry, you don't feel worthy. And my answer to that is, thank God that you don't feel worthy. I get really frightened if somebody comes to me and says, you know what, I've been called to pastoral ministry, and I'm ready, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, because here's the thing. Anyone who's in any form of leadership, whether it be a pastor, a deacon, an elder, whatever, knows that we cannot do it on our own. We can only do it through the power of God. God that we realize that we cannot do those things on our own. And, and as Christians, when we come to Christ, that's when we realize how much we really can't do. But he is offering us this bread of life. He is offering us himself. He has offered us himself through his 
sacrifice on the cross. And we have to accept it. Another thing that's even more difficult to realize is that not only can we not work our way into heaven, we can't work anyone else into heaven. And that's real difficult when you think about some of your loved ones that might not be believers. My grandmother was a believer. She worked hard. And she prayed for me. And she offered that bread of life. She had the bread of life and she offered to share it with me. But here's the thing. We all want to do that. We all want to, once we have the bread of life ourselves, we want to share it. But we cannot force anyone to take it. And the hard thing to understand is that there will be those that will reject it. But we still have to offer it. We still have to share it. So once you have accepted the bread of life, once you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the, the role then is to share your bread. And you want to share it with any and everyone that you can. But most of all, the Bible calls us to share it with the least amongst us. And some of the most vulnerable, some of the, 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 the most, the ones that need the care the most are our children. Both the unborn and the born. Just let that sink in. Both the unborn and those who are born. Now what happens, unfortunately, with some of our children, and I say our children, and the reason that I say our children is because many of you have children in your own household. Either, either they were born to you or you adopted them, and they are children that are part of your internal family. But every child, each and every child, when you look at that child, you are looking at the image of God. And in that essence, because they are the image of God, as we are the image of God, they are our children. And so when, we, when we're when we looking to share the bread of life, we should share it with our children. But there's a problem that we run into sometimes. And that's the same problem that might have been happening in our text today with some of those individuals. Some of those individuals, when they sat down to listen to Jesus and he created the miracle and he fed them, that might have been the only meal they had that week. But because now their, belt, their bellies are full, they're able to hear what Jesus has to say. We cannot share our bread, we cannot share Jesus Christ with our children until they feel safety, security, and they have trust. And what is unfortunate in our society is that there are those out there, there are those children right now that they don't feel safe, they don't feel secure, and they don't trust. And so that means that we might have to work a little bit harder, first of all, to make sure they have those things. But once they know they have that safety, they know that they are safe, that no one's going to abuse them, that no one's going to hurt them, that they are going to be loved. Once they have that security of knowing that I'm going to get a meal on a regular basis, that I'm going to have clothes on my back, that I'm going to be able to have good hygiene. Once they realize they have that security, then they can start to trust. And then we can work at building that trust between us and that child. And once we're able to do that, then we can share our bread because they're going to be open to hearing what we have to say. But they will not be there until they have safety, security, and trust. And so the question is, well, what can we do? What can we do in order to be able to share our bread with the least among us? What can we do in order to share our bread with these children? And the thing is, well, the, the first question we have to ask is, how can we help to provide that safety, security, and that trust? Well, for some, for some, such as myself, for some, such as Jay and Joe, for some, such as the Wolves, the call has been to adoption. And once we do that, we begin to build that safety. We, we give them safety, we give them security, we give them trust. But here's the thing, with many of those individuals, at least in my case, and I believe in the Wolfie's case, there was a foster parent that was there before us. And that foster parent's job was to provide that safety, security, 
security and trust. And hopefully they were about believing foster parents because then they started to share the bread. Maybe it comes in the form of mentoring. Because sometimes, again, as, as was expressed earlier with, with Acosta, sometimes the only normalcy, the only regularity that a child will have in his life is a mentor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be transparent here. I, I remember when Whitney came to me and asked me to get involved in the in-school mentoring program. Half an hour a, a week. And I remember thinking, I didn't say this out loud, but I thought, how much of a difference can half an hour a week make? I mean, really? What, what, what difference can I make in anyone's life for half an hour a week? Well, I have to repent of my doubt because now that I've been doing it, I've been able to see that it does matter. Because that is a half an hour a week of safety. That is a half an hour a week of security. That is a half an hour a week in which trust is built between me and that individual. And then I can start to share my bread. All of us have some degree of responsibility. Not all of us are called to be adoptive parents. Not all of us are called to be foster parents. Not all of us are necessarily called to be a mentor to a child. But maybe that parent needs mentoring. There is no instruction book. If it was, it would make for those of us that like to do things step by step, it make it so easy. Okay. At two years old, do this. At five years old, do this. At 15, okay, that's great. I've got the instruction book. But there is none. So sometimes, maybe parents need mentors as well. But in some way, we want to make sure that we are supporting the least among us. And once we've done that, once they're safe, once they're secure, once they trust you, then you can share your bread. And as, as you're sharing your bread with them, sharing your bread with someone else, and you know the wonderful thing about the bread of life? It never runs out. It's always available. Now, if you ever invite me over to your house for Thanksgiving and dinner or any kind of dinner that involves turkey, I love cranberries. Just letting you know ahead of time. I love cranberries. All kinds of cranberries. It can be the whole cranberries that most people think are disgusting, or it can be the cranberries in the jail form. But I love cranberries. So what needs to happen is to make sure that when we're passing things around, pass the cranberries to me first. <laughs> now that we can make sure we get, I get some, because what can happen is you pass everything around, especially if there's a lot of people there, you pass everything around, the cranberries get to me, and they're all gone. And I'm not happy because I don't have cranberries. When that doesn't happen with the bread of life, the bread of life never runs out. There will always be bread of life up until Christ returns. Now when Christ returns, no more bread. But until he does, the bread of life will always be available. So you don't have to worry about it running out. So just keep sharing it. Keep sharing it. Keep sharing it. Knowing that there will be those that will reject it. They will say, I don't want it. And that is okay. That is not their, your role is not to force them to take the bread. Your role is to offer it. To share it with all who you can. But, but by the grace of God, please share it with our children. Please share it with our youth. And why is that important? Well, I'll just ask you this. Do you believe the Bible? No, that, that's a good question. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. Okay, what does the Bible say? Train the child in the village of school, and when they are old, they will not be part from it. Says that, right? And so, as a part of sharing your bread with the youngest among us, if we do that, there will be those that will reject it, but there will be those that will take it and they will be trained up, and when they are old, they are not going to depart from it because it is a part of them. So share. And it doesn't have to be someone that is a blood relation to you. It might be someone you might find for some reason there's some child in this community that just clings to you. You have absolutely no idea why this particular child just clings to you. They just come to you. They just enjoy being in your presence. That's a sign. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Share your bread. Bread of life sent down the 